Welcome to Counterspin, your weekly look behind the headlines of the mainstream news. I'm Janine Jackson, here with Steve Rendell. This week on Counterspin, journalists and pundits say Vladimir Putin is off his rocker. And the proof is his invasion of Crimea and his crazy suggestion that the U.S. has, on several occasions, acted lawlessly. We'll talk with Robert Perry of Consortium News about the U.S., Russia, and the power struggle over Ukraine. Also on the show, Barack Obama announces a new initiative with the goal of improving opportunities for black and Latino boys and men, with a big emphasis on the role of fathers. For many media, the only question seems to be, why'd he wait so long? But there are deeper questions to consider about the effort called My Brother's Keeper. We'll hear from Luke Charles Harris of Vassar College about that. All of that's coming up, but first, as usual, we'll take a look back at the week's press. U.S. weakness emboldened Russia to occupy Crimea. That's the gist of much punditry in recent days. It's a right-wing theme that seems to have transcended conservative media. For instance, informing a question Meet the Press host David Gregory posed to GOP Senator Marco Rubio. Do you agree with some of your colleagues who say it's the weakness of President Obama in the United States right now that has emboldened President Putin of Russia? Gregory repeated the theme several times, getting NBC political wag Chuck Todd to agree. Quote, this is not the first time with Putin. Putin acts, Obama warns. Putin acts, Obama warns. This is a pattern that he can't afford to stay in there and just continue to warn. You heard John Kerry, more warnings, close quote. Washington Post editors offered a variation on the theme, quote, The United States now faces a naked act of armed aggression in the center of Europe by a Russian regime that is signaling its intent to steamroller this U.S. president and his allies, close quote. Cokie Roberts thought it was worthwhile to use her time as a political commentator on NPR to quote Senator Lindsey Graham saying, quote, We have a weak and indecisive president that invites aggression, close quote. Guardian writer Michael Cohen seemed to be responding to all of this when he offered a very different take. Quote, Shocking as it may be, sometimes countries take actions based on how they view their interests, irrespective of who the U.S. did or did not bomb. Close quote. It's telling that you had to go outside the U.S. media to hear such a viewpoint. It was ostensibly a news article, but the Washington Post's March 3rd piece on Republican Representative Paul Ryan's critique of federal anti-poverty programs sure looked a lot like a press release. The story by Robert Costa said Ryan's often stinging indictment amounts to a preemptive rebuttal to the president's budget that signals Republicans' desire to expand their pitch to voters. Quote, on page after page, the report casts a critical eye on how the government administers money to the poor and related bureaucracies, using a bevy of academic literature and federal studies as evidence, close quote. With the exception of a soundbite from one Democratic congressman, the sources in the article are Ryan himself and a handful of his Republican colleagues, saying things like, Paul Ryan remains our big ideas guy. Well, it's a shame the Post couldn't find other sources, like, say, some of the authors of that bevy of academic literature. As documented by Rob Garver at the Fiscal Times, it turns out several of them say Ryan misrepresents their work. One example, Ryan cites a study by the Columbia Population Research Center measuring the decline in poverty after the launch of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. The study found the poverty rate fell from 26% in 1967 to 15% in 2012. But Ryan only cites data from 1969 onward, ignoring a full 36% of the decline. One of the study's authors said that surprised her. Quote, in my experience, usually you use all of the available data. There's no justification given. It's unfortunate because it really understates the progress we've made in reducing poverty, close quote, which one suspects was the point. Just as omitting actual poverty researchers from a story on Ryan's poverty report really understates the amount of misrepresentations it contains. Imagine a protest in a nation's capital resulting in hundreds of arrests of peaceful demonstrators, 
drawing attention to a political controversy. If we're to believe anti-government activist in Venezuela, the fact that television didn't cover an event is proof that the government is stifling the press. But the demonstration we're talking about occurred in Washington, D.C., where hundreds of protesters were arrested in front of the White House for urging the president to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. According to a search of the Nexus News database, the protest hardly made a sound in the corporate media. There was a one-sentence mention on CNN and a brief note on ABC's Good Morning America, where viewers were told that there was, quote, a chaotic scene at the White House Sunday as hundreds of demonstrators chained themselves to the fence and spread across Pennsylvania Avenue, refusing to move. They were protesting the proposed Keystone oil pipeline extension, claiming that it would damage the environment, close quote. The hometown Washington Post, as well as the New York Times, only ran short, web-only stories. One of the few more thorough reports on the protests came from the independent media. Democracy Now! host Amy Goodman explained that the protest, quote, could be the largest youth sit-in on the environment in a generation, close quote. And she interviewed a climate activist. As recent weeks have shown, corporate media coverage of activism depends on how the government feels about the activists. Veteran journalist Robert Kaiser wrote a farewell column for the Washington Post that was revealing. Kaiser explained that in the good old days, he loved the politicians he covered. But these days, they simply don't tell the truth. Quote, lies and intellectual inventions are now typical of our public life, close quote. And he gives examples, including Republicans denying climate science and calling Barack Obama a socialist dictator. What's interesting is what Kaiser says is the media problem. Quote, One of my frustrations in recent years has been the journalistic conventions that can make it difficult to speak or write in a straightforward way about people who make preposterous statements. Close quote. Well, this is an important admission. But in exposing one troubling media tendency, he provides an example of another, false balance. Kaiser felt the need to balance his mentions of Republican misrepresentations with the line, quote, not that Democrats are all that clever and insightful, close quote. His example is a slip of the tongue comment about Vietnam by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. To be fair, Kaiser does wind up acknowledging that more of the trouble is on the Republican side, but still he can't resist straddling the middle. He explains that the Republican Party has moved well to the right. But then, hey, look at the Democrats. They've become a, quote, more liberal alliance of mostly interest groups. Women, trade unionists, gay men and lesbians, blacks, Hispanics, and most of the country's intellectuals, close quote. Women, black people, Hispanics, you know, interest groups. Kaiser's goodbye to Washington journalism is revealing in more ways than he probably intended. And finally, Time Magazine's March 10th issue takes a look at the debate over raising the minimum wage. But the problem in the piece by Eliza Gray is evident from the first paragraph. It begins, quote, If you want to make some new friends and just as many enemies, here's a helpful shortcut. Take a position on raising the federal minimum wage. The question of how much workers at the bottom should be paid is fast becoming one of the most divisive issues in Washington. Close quote. Then after stating what liberals say versus what conservatives say, she writes, quote, Get ready to hear a lot more about it between now and the November midterms as Democrats and Republicans fight over the merits of an increase, which 76% of Americans favor, according to Gallup. Close quote. So the first sentence tells you that you'll make an equal number of friends and enemies by taking a position on the minimum wage, and the last sentence tells you that 76% of Americans favor an increase. It's mathematically challenged, but not without a point, which is to present a worker-friendly policy that most people support as actually divisive. Reporters seem to think that makes them centrist when it really just makes them wrong. Thank you, Steve. You're listening to Counterspin, brought to you each week by the Media Watch Group Fair. To hear it from U.S. corporate media, Russian President Vladimir Putin has gone off the deep end, irrationally escalating tensions over the turmoil in Ukraine by invading Crimea 
and accusing the U.S. of breaking international law. Moreover, overtly nationalist U.S. reporting typically portrays the U.S. as the even-tempered voice of reason, democracy, and the Ukrainian people. Of course, there is always more to the story than that, and with us to talk about that is Robert Perry of Consortium News at consortiumnews.com. That's where you can read his two latest pieces on the Ukraine, the U.S., and Russia. Robert Perry, welcome back to Counterspin. Thanks for having me. The talk that Putin has lost his mind is all over our news media. Many pundits have said as much, journalists too. For instance, a headline over a Washington Post editorial read, Has Vladimir Putin lost touch with reality? Why do they question Putin's sanity? According to the Post editorial, it's because he recites instances when the U.S., quote, acted either without any sanction from the U.N. Security Council or distorted the content of these resolutions, close quote. Robert Perry, is that a sure sign of delusion? Well, it seems to be delusion on the part of the Washington Post editorial writers. This has been sort of a, a strange problem that we've seen become very dangerous around the Ukraine crisis, is this idea of demonizing Vladimir Putin. Uh, it's, it's sort of common practice almost now when the official Washington decides to uh, declare someone a villain, whether no matter how much they may deserve it or some of them, of course, probably do deserve it. But once the demonization begins, then almost nothing uh, nice can be said about somebody. No balance or nuance can be inserted. It has to be a, a, uh, just someone wearing a, a big black hat. And now that's being done to Putin. And if you actually read the transcript of his news conference, which has been this point that folks have been citing, he was actually quite articulate. And it wasn't rambling as the, as the Washington Post tried to present it. It was a news conference where he responded to questions from, from journalists, and in some cases very specifically and in, and in real detail. What seems upsetting to the Washington Post and other major news organizations, many of which supported the Iraq War and uh, any number of other cases of U.S. interventions abroad, is that Putin is essentially saying that they should be held to the same standard that other people are. Uh, the Post can, can, can articulate how awful it is for any other country to violate inter- international law, but the Washington Post was very much on board the U.S. violating international law on a repeated basis, uh, going back in history, but also fairly even recently in the last decade or so. I should mention here that the Washington Post was not alone with this theme that Vladimir Putin has lost his mind, but let's go into a little bit of that history. Well, in the case of going back just back into this century, Secretary of State John Kerry said this is not what the Russians did in Crimea is not 21st century behavior where you would cross on other countries' borders and violate their sovereignty. Well, that's just is rather, <laughs> it's, it's almost, speaking of delusional, for a U.S. politician, particularly one who voted to authorize the Iraq war, as Senator Kerry did, to make those kinds of remarks suggests a complete detachment from any kind of self-awareness of what he himself has done. And that pervades across almost the spectrum of American politics right now and across the news media, where you have uh, the Washington Post, which was a major supporter of the Iraq war, reporting as flat fact that uh, Saddam Hussein was hiding his weapons of mass destruction, which he didn't have. The Washington Post and and other major news organizations have supported the the Afghanistan war. They've they've supported uh, attacks across... uh, uh, international borders by the United States in the war on terror. Uh, they supported the intervention in Libya, which led to the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. They were supporting uh, plans to bomb Syria just last summer. So when you look at all these different moments when the Washington Post, not just the Washington Post, but the mainstream media in general, and much of American, uh, the political spectrum, supports these kinds of uh, U.S. interventions abroad. And then when the, when the Russians respond to a very ambiguous crisis right across their border, where an elected president was overthrown in part by uh, neo-Nazi uh, militias, uh, when they respond to try to protect or to move in to, to protect uh, areas of, of historic interest to them, suddenly it's, it's DEFCON 5 around here. <laughs> 
there's a lot of news now about Kerry traveling about, even in Kiev, trying to tamp down tempers. You know, how, how do you respond to that when, when the United States' role in inflaming the situation is, is fairly obvious? Well, it's, it certainly is way past time for various adults to come in and try to tamp down this crisis. Uh, this, is a, this could be a confrontation between nuclear-armed states in the West and, and Russia, which is a nuclear-armed state. Not that I think people think it will go in that direction, but when one keeps escalating the rhetoric and escalating the tensions, and now you have uh, uh, sec- former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton comparing Putin to Hitler. You have on the op-ed page of the, of the, of the Washington Post on Thursday, you had one of their editorialists, Charles Lane, uh, saying that that's a good comparison between Putin and Hitler. When you're moving to this rhetorical level, mm-hmm. uh, and, when, and when you also have people like Carl Gershman, uh, who was, who's the president of the National Endowment for Democracy, which has been one of the groups that keeps stirring up trouble around the world, when you have him saying that the real target of all this has to be Putin and Moscow, uh, you are asking for some potentially grave dangers. And for that to happen, one would at least hope that the, that the National Press Corps and, and various political leaders would try to be reasonable and try to use calmer language and try not to do these hyperboles. On previous episodes of Counterspin, Russia expert Stephen Cohen has made the point that the Cold War has really never completely ended for many U.S. officials and journalists, and that Russia's relationship to the West and the U.S. could be much better, but for the routine snubs that Russia has encountered from the West, particularly the United States. Robert Perry, to make these points that sometimes Putin talks sense and that the U.S. hasn't always dealt fairly with Russia is not to say that the standard for international behavior, say, 21st century behavior, is Vladimir Putin, is it? Well, no. no I think there, there are a lot of legitimate criticisms of, of any political leader, including Putin. Uh, and, and certainly the way, the way Russia operates is not an ideal democracy, although one could argue that neither is, is ours, the American democracy, uh, where you need supports of millionaires and billionaires to even be considered seriously to run for president. But there is this point where the United States has to uh, has to come to grips with the fact, or should come to grips with the fact that that other countries have legitimate interests, that they ha- they see the world through a somewhat different lens, but it's, it's, it sometimes can be very legitimate. And the United States doesn't have all the wisdom and all the the, the claims to to righteousness. Uh, in fact, uh, as we've talked about, the United States has often violated many of the same rules that it has laid down certainly since World War II, certainly since the Nuremberg Tribunals, the, uh, the U.N. Charter, and so forth, the United States has frequently uh, violated uh, those rules and done so with, uh, with, a, with generally approval of the, of the National Press Corps. We've been speaking with Robert Perry of Consortium News at consortiumnews.com. His latest book is America's Stolen Narrative, From Washington and Madison to Nixon, Reagan and the Bushes to Obama. Thanks again for joining us today on Counterspin, Robert Perry. Thank you, Steve. The My Brother's Keeper initiative announced by Barack Obama has been received warmly in the press. And why not? Explained by ABC News as a plan backed by hundreds of millions of dollars from private foundations to help parents and young men break the cycle of violence and poverty, it certainly sounds like a laudable effort. But a plan for helping black and brown men that comes with the endorsement of Bill O'Reilly ought to raise at least a few red flags. What questions aren't we hearing about the emphasis and approach of My Brother's Keeper, and what and who is missing? Luke Charles Harris is professor of American politics and constitutional law at Vassar College and co-founder of the African American Policy Forum, of which I'm a board member. He joins us now by phone from Poughkeepsie. Welcome to Counterspin, Luke Harris. Uh, Happy to be here, Janine. Well, I have to say first, I don't really understand exactly what My Brother's Keeper is. I've heard it described as an effort to better outcomes for the nation's most at-risk young men. I've heard it described as commitments from leaders from all walks of American life. 
to help young men break the cycle of violence and poverty. But then the actual conversations all seem to come down to how important it is to have a father. Um, Before we get to who's left out, I wonder, do you see a clear relationship between the problems being described, high rates of incarceration, high rates of unemployment, and this as a response to them? What's the relationship there? Well, frankly, I I don't see a concrete relationship between the institutional and structural problems that lead to incarceration and underemployment and and unemployment and the problems with respect to wealth acquisition that exist in in the African-American community. It seems more like this program is a a response to the idea of of a kind of cultural poverty. Uh, Sort of if you could fix black fathers and Latino fathers, and if they just had the right values, they could take advantage of the opportunities that were already there in in our kind of open, supposedly egalitarian society. Yes, Bill O'Reilly says in order to help children at risk, the American society has got to convince them to stop destructive behavior, like using drugs, committing violence, getting pregnant outside of marriage. It sounds like a very kind of old school approach saying that the problems with black and brown boys and men are created by black and brown boys and men. Well, it sounds very much like that. I mean, it seems like there's a focus on some of the symptoms of of white supremacy and and continuing problems of institutional and structural discrimination in the United States are ignored, basically trivialized. And the problem, rather, is is kind of focused on the behavior of men in the community, right? It becomes, it seems like it's a, it's one of these old value arguments. It's that there are certain types of values that don't exist and aren't practiced in the African American community. And if they were, the idea is that things would be better. You know, this is an argument that has been made at every epical moment in American history with respect to to both blacks and Latinos. I mean, people argued that even when blacks were slaves, that they were lazy. People argued that blacks didn't have a work ethic during the era of apartheid. You know, you, you have to imagine that people might think that, okay, so you thought if you, if you set all black Americans down, and black men in particular, and they just had the right values in their head during the era of apartheid, everything would have been okay, and they would have been able to move into the American political and economic and cultural systems just like anyone else. And just like that wasn't true during the era of Jim Crow, uh, for reasons that reflect the contours of de facto segregation and continuing problems of discrimination in the post-civil rights era, it's, it's not true here either. Well, we know that, as you've indicated, this isn't the first iteration of this, even in the recent past. Uh, Foundations, for example, have been talking about the need to focus on black men and boys for years now. Talk about what's missing from that framework. What's the problem with it? Well, you know, that framework is based on a framework that, to tell you the truth, for a long time was the framework that I used. It was the endangered black male narrative. That's the way I approach my politics and until, you know, the early stages of middle age. And, and it had a lot of appeal to me. I mean, I was raised by a, a black American woman who worked as a maid for 50 years. And my biological mother got caught up in the underground economy, got caught up in, in heroin addiction and, and other things. My politics for a long time focused on the absence of black men and the absence of a father. I mean, the father that I... Uh, had my memories of him, they're, they're basically negative memories. But, you know, notwithstanding the role that my father did or didn't play in my life, it, it, you know, I came to learn over time that my politics had to reflect not just the uh, dilemmas and the problematics that were a function of the obstacles that black men face, but also the endangered black women that I grew up around. And I, I think that that's something that's been a hard lesson to learn for us in the African-American community, the ways in which uh, this idea of, of endangered members of our community really rests not just in the laps of, of boys and men, but also firmly in the laps of girls and women. Well, and it's almost, um, it's a distortion to try to separate them. I mean, they don't, they don't come separate if you're talking about a community, and there are negative impacts in terms of kind of erasing women and girls from that 
that framework. Not that it's a comparison, you know, but it introduces problems or it ignores problems if you don't also talk about women and girls at the same time. Well, that's the problem. I mean, you know, it's fabulous to have a program that's directed at what are the perceived needs of African-American boys and men and Latino boys and men, um, if you're talking in terms of institutional and structural obstacles and combating them. Uh, But to do that and not focus on the women in those communities is to pursue a, a, a vision of racial justice that's only deeply connected to the lives of half of our community. So in the short term and the long term, that's not going to be in the best interest of the community. It's not how we should think about politics, and it's not how we should shape public policies. Well, let me just ask you finally, rife with pitfalls as it is, and we can see it to be, it's not that it's a bad conversation to have started. Um, What ideas would you like to see informing the conversations that we're bound to have around My Brother's Keeper as it goes forward? And who could reporters be talking to? Who should be included in that conversation? Well, you know, it needs to be an inclusive vision of what it means to to talk about issues of racial justice. And it needs to focus on not just boys and men, but women and girls. I I think it's really important to talk to people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Beth Ritchie and uh, Uma Narayan and Devin Carbato. You know, people who bring to the table a vision of racial justice that focused on all sectors of communities of color and that don't privilege one sector over the next. We've been speaking with Luke Charles Harris of Vassar College. You can find the African American Policy Forum on the web at aapf.org. Thank you so much, Luke Harris, for joining us joining us today on Counterspin. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeannie. And that's it for Counterspin for this week. Counterspin is produced by FAIR, the National Media Watch Group based in New York. For more information about FAIR, you can check out our website, fair.org. The show is engineered by Alex Noyes. With me is Steve Rendell. I'm Janine Jackson. Thank you for listening to Counterspin. <laughs>